Welcome, everyone. Can everyone hear me? So I'm Corinna Tritel from the Department of History, and it's my great honor to introduce uh, Michael Y. Session, who will be giving the Assembly Series talk today. I wanted to say just a couple of words about Frankenstein um, and then tell you what a geophysicist might have to do with Frankenstein. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard, Mary Shelley's novel is turning 200 this year. She wrote it when she was um, 18 years old in 1818. Uh, and we're having a big party to celebrate this novel and um, all the cultural work that it has done in the intervening 200 years. Um, if you haven't read it yet, I won't spoil the ending, but it's a story of a college student who's studying chemistry, um, who makes a creature out of dead body parts and then runs away. Um, and it's about what happens after he runs away. Uh, and um, the novel is interesting for all kinds of reasons. It is often drawn into discussions about science and social responsibility, um, which it may be one of the themes that we talk about today. WashU is celebrating this with a series of talks, films, um, readings, exhibits. We're also, for any students in the audience, we're having a monster challenge. And I'm going to hold up the flyer. Um, so this is a creative competition open to any enrolled WashU student, graduate or undergraduate. And the challenge is to write um, or perform or create visually the new Frankenstein, a Frankenstein for the 21st century. Um, and since, at, and by the way, the grand prize is $1,000. So it's worth, yes, it's worth investing your energy. I wanted to let you know for any um, STEMI folks in here, and I hope there are a lot of STEM folks in here, Science Magazine just did a really neat issue on Frankenstein, um, which has all kinds of great ideas for creative work on what a new Frankenstein might look like in the 21st century. There's stuff here on bionics, on transplants, on growing human organs in pigs, um, really good stuff. So if anyone's looking for ideas, I'd say go there. Okay, so what does this gentleman, Michael Weiss Session, have to do with Frankenstein? Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about uh, him, and I think you'll get the picture. He is a geophysicist who specializes in seismology, um, which for those of you who don't know what that is, I happen to be the daughter of a seismologist. Um, it means studying the way that waves propagate um, through the earth. So think earthquakes. He teaches a whole series of courses from introductory courses on earthquakes, volcanoes, and plate tectonics to upper level courses in his specialty, seismology, to very innovative uh, interdisciplinary courses on evolution, which combine readings in geology and biology with readings from literature, philosophy, um, and ethics. Um, he's also, and I think this is something that we should really celebrate um, in our scientists here at WashU, he has made science education and science communication a real priority. He's written textbooks on seismology for undergraduate and graduate students. He has also written elementary school textbooks um, on geology. He has two videos with the teaching company on uh, different aspects of geology. Four. Oh, yeah, four? Oh, okay, four. He has four? Yeah. He's been involved um, in uh, writing um, next generation science standards for K through 12 students. And he has a talking head. Whenever there's an earthquake or some kind of event like this, he's called in um, by local and national media. Um, so what I'm saying here is that he is both an accomplished scientist and also someone who has dedicated a lot of his brain power and his time to bringing the insights of science into public conversation. Um, he's a beloved co uh, colleague to me but also a role model for all of us um, about how to be both a scholar and a socially engaged citizen. We need more people like Michael Y. Session um, in this world. Uh, and I hope that you will join me in welcoming him as he talks about Frankenstein meets climate change, monsters of our own making. Thank you very much, Jim. Well, it's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here. I've been coming to these assembly series talks for um, uh, 27 years now. And so 
um, it's fun to actually be able to have a chance to 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 give one of these myself. I'm switching to my uh, computer glasses here. Finding the right distance uh, to you know the right glasses to to use is often a, a challenge. Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein 200 years ago. It is a brilliant story of warning and caution that has consistently captured the attention of readers ever since, partly because of its timelessness, it, its relevance during pretty much every phase of our technological history. A, a lot has been made, as Corinna mentioned in recent times, about the warning that Frankenstein provides for medical ethics creating life from death, meddling in the realm of gods. You know, it's a story of Prometheus with significant implications for modern biology, genomics, CRISPR technology, um, and also about the dangers of computational artificial intelligence, um, you know, creating a different kind of, of life. But I'm going to follow a slightly different path. I'm going to look at climate and climate change, both in the role that it played in the writing of Frankenstein 200 years ago and the role that it plays now, as Corinna said, as a monster of our own making. Um, you know, WashU has recently had speaker series events both on the bicentennial fright of the writing of Frankenstein and on climate change, so I thought I would capitalize on these and put them together. So here it is, Frankenstein meets climate change. Um, now, Frankenstein is a story in 24 chapters with a preface. I've only got about an hour, so I'm going to tell my story in 12 chapters with a preface. And... While Frankenstein and global warming are both tragedies of a sort, um, like Frankenstein, my talk here is going to have a, a ray of hope at the end, uh, I hope. All right. First of all, um, I'm not an expert on Frankenstein, and I'm not a research expert on climate science. Um, however, I have always been a fan of the fantasy and horror literary genres uh, and in fact, my first publication, long before any geophysical publications on seismology, was actually in a weird fiction fanzine called Ibid, and the title of my published article was The Role of the Theme of Vampirism in Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. Um, so this was actually my start into, into scholarship. Um, and though my own research does not concern climate science, I do spend now a good deal of my spare time advocating for science literacy, science education at many levels. Um, and a big focus of this is obviously on global warming and the role that humans play in it. And, and I will tie this into my story at the end as well. Oh, and by the way, I feel a certain recent affinity with the monster Frankenstein following my recent craniotomy last May where I had a benign brain tumor removed um, from my forehead and my family called me Frankenstein. So, so here we go, Frankenstein. All right, here's the story. Um, an English captain sails towards the North Pole in search of great discovery for personal pride and glory at great risk to his crew. He gets stuck in the pack ice, picks up a half-frozen delirious man on a dog sled, the man dies, a strange creature appears and cries over the body. The creature heads off across the ice and the captain turns back. Sorry, I should have said spoiler alert there. But, uh, most of you, however, are more familiar with the story within the story. The story of that delirious man on the dog sled, of a prideful and ambitious young student, Victor Frankenstein, or Frankenstein, who, who takes advantage of the cutting-edge bioengineering technologies of his day to create life out of death. And when Victor succeeds, he panics. He makes a long series of very bad decisions, and everybody dies. Okay. It's kind of a glum ending. Um, just as interesting, however, is the story within the story within the story of that creature's own discovery of the world and himself, and his place in it, both physically and ethically. Um, and there are stories within that story, such as the downfall of the aristocratic family, whose house the creature hides out at while he learns about humanity. Um, there's an allegory, a fable, an epistolary novel, and even part of an autobiography here. You know, 
And part of this book's appeal is the number of different stories contained within this relatively short novel and the many different ways that they can be interpreted. Um, but I'm just going to focus on the first two stories and use them as a tale of warning for us in our current moment in cultural evolution. Okay. Now, over the years, Hollywood has paired up the Frankenstein story with lots of other things. There's Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, Frankenstein meets the space monster, there's Frankenstein and the monster from hell, there's Dracula versus Frankenstein, there's Frankenstein versus the mummy, uh, there's Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, there's even Alvin and the Chipmunks meet Frankenstein. So, so here's my take on it. Frankenstein meets climate change. All right. Now, one of the first things I'm sure you noticed in that list of movies was that they all get the name wrong, right? In Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Frankenstein wasn't the monster. Victor Frankenstein was the scientist. The, the monster didn't have a name. Victor called it all sorts of things, creature, fiend, demon, wretch. Um, though the monster itself suggests to Victor that he should be called Adam, Victor's creation. Exactly when this change in name happened is unclear, but it became common after the release of the very famous popular 1931 James Hale movie starring Colin Clive as Victor Frankenstein and Boris Karloff as the monster. And you may notice that it, its title has it correct, Frankenstein, the man who made a monster. However, this movie portrayed Victor as a middle-aged man. But he wasn't in the book. As Corinna mentioned, Mary Shelley's Victor started studying how to create life as a young chemistry student at college, probably in his early 20s, and probably he was around 22 years old or so when he brought the creature to life. Um, the recent remake with James McAvoy as a med student is a little more accurate here. Um, but like the 1931 movie, it also includes the role of Igor or Igor, for friends of uh, fans of Young Frankenstein, uh, played here by the, the Harry Potter guy, um, which was not in the original book. But that's a very important point to remember, and I'm going to come back to this. Victor was not so different from many of the people here on campus, science majors at a top research university, and I'm going to come back to this. So most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the story here. Um, in 1816, the year that the book was started, the 18-year-old Mary Godwin was vacationing in Geneva, Switzerland with her soon-to-be husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, along with friends Lord Byron and writer-physician John Polidori. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't much of a vacation because the weather was terrible. Um, it was gloomy, dark rainy, cold. So the group of writers largely stayed indoors and decided to have a competition to see who could write the best horror story, sort of matching the mood of the season. Now, Mary wrote Frankenstein, combining aspects of modern science of the time and cultural trends and also some autobiographical hardships uh, from her own life. Lord Byron never actually finished his contribution, um, but the fragment of a novel, or the burial a fragment, as it's sometimes known, was one of the first English stories to actually feature vampires, which was how I learned about this in my research for the Fall of the House of Usher piece. And their other companion, John Polidori, actually took Byron's fragment and fleshed it out, publishing it a few years later. In, in fact, the book The Vampire, which actually used the person of Lord Byron as the model for the, the vampire himself, um, became the forerunner of the romantic vampire novel. Um, you know, Bram Stoker's Dracula wasn't written until the end of the 19th century in, in 1897. Well, the weather throughout Western Europe that summer um, was extremely miserable. The flooding in Europe was so severe in places that many European countries actually established their first meteorology programs to try to understand and forecast the weather. And the reason, of course, as you've gathered, if you didn't already, from the flyer, was 
a volcano, um, a very large volcanic eruption. In fact, it was the largest in the past 500 years. Um, this was the eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia in 1815. And to give you a sense of the size of this, this eruption ejected about 100 cubic kilometers of tephra. This is ash and rock up into the atmosphere. Um, Mount St. Helens, the eruption in 1980, that ejected one cubic kilometer. This was 100. This is 100 times larger than the eruption of Mount St. Helens. We haven't seen anything like this in the past 200 years. This is the volcano, how it looks today. It still smolders. It still could go off at some point. The impact of the eruption on the climate is not actually due to the ash. It's primarily due to the ejection of sulfate aerosols. These are tiny droplets of liquid sulfuric acid that are at just the right size to block out sunlight. This results in a drop in global temperatures and a disruption in atmospheric flow patterns and weather around the world gets affected. The weather was unusually cold in North America and Europe. There, there were snows in the summertime. Uh, actually, Lord Byron in, this, in that summer in 1816 wrote a poem called Darkness, which began, I had a dream which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished. Um, this is typically observed. There's so much ash and, and aerosols in the atmosphere. The sun, it, it, before an eruption in, um, in Lockheed, uh, before uh, following an eruption in Lockheed in 1783, Ben Franklin in Paris actually documented that the sun was shining at about half its normal strength. Atmospheric circulation over the summer of 1816 was very unusual. Storm tracks that would normally have gone north and missed Europe were shifted to the south. Recurrent low-pressure air systems brought cold air and heavy, long-lasting rainfall to Western and Central Europe. Um, in other words, it was cold and wet. Um, temperatures in Western Europe were two to three degrees uh, lower than normal. And rainfall precipitation was twice as much in Western and Central Europe um, than typical. The effects were also large on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is an interesting story that ends up having impacts on St. Louis. Um, the summer in New England was extremely cold and severe. They were rock widespread crop failures up and down the East Coast. It snowed in Boston in July and in August. In fact, the Vermont town of Granby actually decided to disincorporate, and everybody gave up and left. Uh, in fact, many people in New England and the mid-Atlantic states left their homes and just headed south and north, looking for some place where they could grow food. Um, and this ended up playing a very important role in the settling of our country, because even though the Louisiana Purchase had, had occurred a dozen years before, it really was starting in 1816, the, that year without a summer, that there was a big push westward. Hungry people, farmers from the east whose crops had been totally destroyed that year. And it's very interesting because if you look at the statehood of some Midwest states, Indiana became a state in December of 1816, Illinois in 1818, Missouri in 1821, the timings of the arrival of people here in St. Louis, as well as of Missouri becoming a state, were actually impacted by this volcano in Indonesia. There were other, many other uh, significant impacts, but there's one more that actually I'll mention because it does end up impacting St. Louis as well, um, and this was cholera. Now, cholera is endemic to the Ganges Delta and had... Uh, been known there for centuries, but it had never spread outward. Uh, however, following the extreme flooding across this flat Ganges River Delta um, and the diaspora of people out, um, the first cholera pandemic began um, in 1817. It first spread westward across um, India. It then spread eastward through Indonesia up into China and Japan. And in fact, it was so bad in Indonesia that huge numbers of people sold themselves into slavery just so they wouldn't starve to death. Um, from India, the cholera spread into Africa, through the Middle East, uh, into Russia. The 
pandemic stalled out for a couple years, but then the second cholera pandemic brought cholera all the way through to Western Europe and eventually to North and South America as well. And the historic St. Louis Bellefontaine Cemetery, with all its beautiful sculptures and mausolea, was actually built in 1849 when cholera finally came up the Mississippi River and killed over about 4,000 people here. So this was a direct result of the volcano in, in Indonesia as well. Now, this is not the first time that a volcanic eruption had caused significant short-term changes in climate that affected humans. This chart shows the history of sulfate aerosol releases from volcanoes going back a 1,000 years. Um, these spikes are measured in millions of tons of, of sulfates released in the atmosphere. Um, and, you know, here's Tambora right here, but this spike before here um, was that Laki eruption in Iceland that I mentioned. The years following this, leading up to the storming of the Bastille, were the coldest in over a century, and the crop failures then, and you know the whole thing about let them eat cake because the loaf of a bread, bre you know, one loaf of bread was more than the cost of, of, of a daily worker's wages, um, was a direct result of the climate change and the crop failures from that volcano. Similar things happened with Huayna in Peru in 1600, in Kauai and Vanuatu in 1452, and the largest of these, Mount Rinjani in 1258, um, also in Indonesia, which is commonly attributed to having triggered the start of the, the very start of the Little Ice Age. You know, all of these, um, each of these has a complex fascinating story of human impacts. You know, each of these was associated with drops in temperature and crop failures and famines and plagues and collapses in government. Um, and I would be happy to tell you all about them so, some other time. Um, because there's one other aspect of climate change that impacted Frankenstein that I want to talk about, and that's the Arctic. In 1816, the Arctic Sea was almost entirely frozen. Okay? This was still during the last phase of the Little Ice Age. It's a period of decreased solar output known as the Dalton Minimum. And um, you know, the Arctic Sea remained largely impassable and therefore was still unknown and unmapped. Um, and there was a lot of attention given to trying to figure out a way to get across it to, to, create, to find this elusive Northwest Passage. Mary Shelley herself was fascinated with the Arctic. Um, she had heard Samuel Taylor Coleridge actually recite his rhyme of the ancient mariner in the home of her parents, uh, which involves um, travel through the Arctic. In her teens, she had eagerly read accounts of early Arctic voyages. Now, the Arctic setting was actually not in her original draft of Frankenstein, apparently, but she added it after reading about current efforts at the time to drum up large support for finding the Northwest Passage. And the Arctic had actually been a, and had followed what was a, a topic of extreme fascination and obsession within literature for much of the 19th century. You'll find it in the writings not only of Coleridge, but of Edgar Allan Poe and Jules Verne and Wilkie Collins and, and uh, char even Charles Dickens and a lot more authors who aren't read much anymore. Um, the, these legends actually go back to the time of the Greeks, who believed there was this magical land, Hyperborea, there, which actually was supposed to be a warm weather, Eden like paradise. Um, you, you can see this made up Arctic continent here at the top of this 1570 map by Abraham or Ortelius. And, and in fact, a lot of detail was sometimes ascribed to this fictional land. Uh, as you can see in this uh, 1595 map by uh, Gerardus Mercator, actually published a year after his death. And, and by the way, this is a polar projection and not a Mercator projection. At the actual pole, there was supposed to be a giant black mountain made of lodestone, of magnetite, which was the reason why all the sailors uh, compasses always pointed north there. Um, I, I will tell you, there is no giant mountain um, at the North Pole. This was obviously fiction. 
and and by to be fair by Mary Shelley's time this land of hyperborea was largely dismissed but the search for the northwest passage was still very much in full force and fame and glory that would come with it um, you know with its discovery was was the reason Shelley's captain Walton um, was heading north now there are a lot of other crazy ideas about the earth that involve the Arctic and the North Pole, largely because they were unverifiable. Um, you couldn't get there to prove it one way or another, but I will just mention one, and that was the hollow earth hypothesis, um, which had actually been put forth by several scientists, including the astronomer Edmund Halley. Um, the idea was that inside the earth it was hollow and maybe even there was another star glowing in the in the center of the planet um, and, and this was the basis for Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth um, Verne always wrote about the current scientific ideas of the time and supposedly the entrance into this was somewhere up in the in the Arctic Sea and I mention this because I was once approached by a very eccentric millionaire who offered me $35,000 and support for a graduate student if I would accompany him on a three-week voyage to the Arctic as the ship's scientist uh, to go look for this hole into the hollow earth. You know, and I thought about it, it's like $35,000, my entire scientific re um, uh, reputation. So um, it, it, it was a... It was a pretty easy decision to make, um, and, and I said no. Um, but I mention that because two summers ago, I did agree to be the ship scientist on, on an Arctic cruise, but this time it was a National Geographic expedition. Um, it sailed from Svalbard up north uh, into the Arctic Circle, and then down the coast of Greenland, going to Jan Mayen Island, back to Greenland, and eventually to Iceland. Um, and it was a fabulous experience. Um, but it was also a very sobering one because the ice was all gone. I mean, all that ice from the 1800s that was preventing people from reaching the North Pole, it, it wasn't there. Um, this is a chart that shows the Arctic pack ice um, from comparing 1990 to 2016. And, you know, if we had taken that voyage back then we'd have had a very rough time because we'd have gone through a lot of ice and by the way the different colors show the age of ice and the point is not only is there less ice here in 2016 it's all young it melts back largely each year um, you know when we took that trip um, we didn't see ice for most of the way. And in fact, this graph is actually from March. I was there in July and there was even less ice. Um, you know, heading north into the Arctic Circle, this is what we saw. You know, Mary Shelley would not have had her captain get stuck in the Arctic Sea um, if she wrote Frankenstein today. Um, now, as we got to Greenland, we did eventually see some ice, and we got into the pack ice, and we got to see some polar bears and all that. I mean, it was wonderful. But it was clearly evident that recent global warming had significantly altered um, the Arctic region. Which brings us to my next chapter, which is that climate change is our monster. Um, 2015, as I'm sure you know, had been the warmest year on record. And 2016 was the warmest year on record. And 2017 was actually the second warmest year on record. But that's only because 2015 and 2016 were in El Nino years. And during an El Nino, essentially the world borrows heat out of the ocean, which warms the atmosphere. And, and by 2017, we were out of that El Nino. But still, it was the second warmest year ever on record uh, I, and we understand the physics of the greenhouse effect we know how this works this isn't random this trend of temperature increase over the past century um, it correlates very well and is driven by the carbon dioxide that we release now about nine gigatons nine billion tons every single year into the atmosphere um, 
But what people often don't realize is the rate of increase is so anomalous in our geologic history. Um, here's a graph that shows the past 1,700 years of global temperature. Actually, I'm sorry, these are northern hemisphere temperatures. And the comparison is a, is a little unfair because this graph does not show um, sort of annual spikes. This, these are average temperatures. But nonetheless, you know, you can see the medieval warm period dropping down about a half a degree on average into the Little Ice Age, um, which had a few different episodes. And then over the past century, the, the upward trend. Now, this graph was made in 2010. Here's 2016. Let me step back and look at the last 12,000 years of temperature change. This is the, the last interglacial, the warm period that followed the long, severe ice age. And uh, as you can see, we had reached our peak about seven or seven and a half thousand years ago, and we're starting to slip off back into the next ice age until we kicked ourselves out of it. And um, this graph was made in 1990. Here's 2016. Right? So you get a sense of these temperatures compared to these long-term averages. Now, this obviously affects many other aspects of the Earth system, as I'm sure you are aware. You increase the atmospheric temperature, you melt ice. And we are now melting ice in Greenland and Antarctica together at a rate of about 400 billion tons every year. And... Um, you melt all that ice, you warm the ocean water, it expands, and the sea level goes up. And the, the thing with this graph, you know, I've, I've been teaching here since 1991, actually, um, but of the very start of this graph. Um, I have to keep changing the numbers. It, it used to be that the sea level was going up at 2.5 millimeters a year, and then it was 3, and now it's 4. So not only is the sea level rising, but the rate at which sea level is rising is going up. And, and of course, you know, that has incredible effects all around world's coastlines. Um, you know, commonly now we see this phenomenon of sunny day flooding. There's no storm here, there's no storm surge, it's high tide so all the roads flood. Um, and a lot has been made about the risks to Florida in particular of sea level rise. Um, this is Florida at, at the present, the current outline. Uh, and um, particularly in the context of what would happen if the ice sheets in West Antarctica were to collapse. And, and West Antarctica in particular because of uh, factors involved with ocean circulation around the pole, West Antarctica has been warming dramatically, about um, 8 degrees Celsius over the last 40 years. And the result is that ice sheets have begun to weaken and collapse. Now, if they were all to go, which we don't think they would in, in any time soon, but if they were, that would result in about a five or six meter sea level rise. It's about 20 feet. So here's Florida with a 20 foot sea level rise. Right? The coastline is significantly altered. But it's not just Florida, right? I mean. All our major cities along the coastlines were built because they were ports. They were at the mouths of rivers. They were involved with shipping and seafaring. And if you look at the east coast of the U.S., along the eastern seaboard, here is it at present. Here it is at 20 feet um, sea level rise. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Norfolk, they're all underwater. Um, and... Think about the diaspora of people that happened um, following Hurricane Katrina. You had almost a million people flee that city permanently and move to other parts in the country. Imagine if that has to start happening all around the coastlines. And, you know, right now you're probably picturing cities around the coast of, of America, but there are other places in the world where this risk is much greater. In fact, Probably the worst is, is back at that Ganges Delta that I talked about with cholera. You know, in Bangladesh and on the Ganges, you have about 150 million people, that's half the U.S. population, living on one river delta. Um, 
because this, all that silt, is, you know, the land is so fertile, you can grow so much food, but they're all very close to sea level. And the scenario of having a hundred, you know, um, million Muslim Bangladeshi fleeing flooded lands into surrounding Hindu India um, sets up a, a potential of conflict that is not like anything we've ever seen. Um, I love this picture of, of Manhattan with a hundred foot sea level rise here. Um, and, and there's a map here, it's hard to see, but here's Carnegie Island, and this is Columbia Island and the Isle of Jersey, uh, the Hudson Inlet. Um, the, the reason this is 100 feet is the last time there was this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, many millions of years ago, sea levels were 75 to 100 feet higher. Now, this is not going to happen quickly. Fortunately, water and ice have very high heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to melt ice, it takes a lot of energy to increase the temperature of water for it to expand. This will take a long time, but this is where our climate system wants to go with just 400 parts per million. And we've blown past it. We're now at 407 and going up rapidly. Um, the other thing I really like about this is um, this is Teaneck Island here. I grew up in Teaneck, New Jersey. My house is right here. My mom is still there. And it, I, you know, I'm glad to know that when all of New York City is gone, my mom's still going to be OK. There, you know. All right. It is clear that these recent changes in climate are our doing. In fact, everything we do now has a large impact on the planet. We are now the largest geologic agent on, on Earth. Um, people talk about how our impacts have brought about the end to the 10,000-year Holocene epoch, you know, the Anthropocene. I'm sure you've heard that term. Forget it. We've blown past it. Our changes have now brought about an end to the 65-million-year Cenozoic era. We are now in the Anthropozoic. Um, to give you an example, the total area of parking lots and paved roads in America is now larger than the size of state of Georgia. Um, the towns and cities we live in together is now larger than the size of the state of California. And in fact, we now use 40% of all the continental land surface just to feed ourselves, our crops and animals, cattle and, and other. Um, and, you know, it's more than that in the U.S., actually. It's more than 50% because we're in a nice temperate climate with very fertile soils. And, you know, there isn't a lot extra there because that remaining land area, that includes um, Antarctica and Greenland and the Sahara Desert and the Himalayas, places that aren't so easy to grow food. Every one of you now requires over 50,000 pounds per year of non, that's 25 tons of non-fuel rock, minerals, and metals just for your stuff, your buildings, your cars, the things we use every single year. And, and in fact, um, that is so much that human-caused erosion rates are now six times greater than all natural causes of erosion together. Right? To give you a scale of this, the, the, the Mississippi... Um, basin, uh, more than th 300,000 miles of over 7,000 different streams um, from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico, washing away the whole interior of our continent from the Rockies to the Appalachians, carries on average between 200 and 500 million tons of rock to the ocean each year. That's about, you know, five trainfuls from New York to Los Angeles. We, sorry, I better not t touch the mic there. We pull out 8,000 million tons, 8 billion tons each year. That's more than an order of magnitude larger. And of course, the biggest thing of, of all, and the factor that causes the global warming I've been talking about, is our insatiable need for energy. Um, we now use energy at a rate of 19 terawatts. And to put that in perspective, the entire planet Earth cools off into space 
at a rate of 46 terawatts. So we use energy at a planetary scale. Now, this number of terawatts is probably not that familiar to you. That's 19 trillion joules a second. Um, J-O-U-L-E, yeah. Um, but a joule, how many of you have an intuitive sense of how much a joule is? Um, all right, well, a joule is the amount of energy it takes to lift an object that is a tenth of a kilogram, um, it's about three and a half ounces, one meter in a gravitational field that's about 10 meters, you know, 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, three and a half ounces, that's, a, that's like a small apple. Right? Newton used apples, uh, supposedly, to inspire him about gravity. Uh, actually, I have a small apple here. Here we go. <laughs> this is a joule. And if I do this every second, that is one watt. Right? Actually, you know what? Um, uh, it's good audience participation here. Would everybody please take out their small apple or, or blackberry or any other small fruit you have or whatever in your pocket? Um, and let, we can do this Jack LaLanne style here. And one, and two, and three, and four. And that, you know, this is good. I've got maybe, I don't know, 80, 60, 80 people doing this all together. All right? My, my arm is starting to get a little tired here. But all of us working together are enough to power one 60-watt light bulb. Okay? If we actually had to generate our own energy ourselves, we would have to, to end up, okay, so I said this, you know, 19 trillion apples lifted one meter each second. For us to make our own energy, each of us would need to bench press 580 pounds one meter every second. Now, it turns out there are a few guys in the world who can do this, okay? They do it once and they're done, okay? This would be every man, woman, and child in the world bench pressing 580 pounds, one meter every second. But it gets worse because we're not everybody. We're America. And we're 4.4% of the world's population, but we use 20% of the world's energy. So everyone in America would have to bench press 2,500 pounds, one meter every second to meet our energy needs. And guess what? there isn't anyone in the world who can do this. Right? And of course, none of this would matter much if it weren't for this. Right? When I was born in 1961, there were 3 billion people on the planet. We had just reached 3 billion. Um, we're now at 7.5 billion. We're adding another billion every 14 years. Um, and I'm not that old. Right? It's more than doubled in my lifetime. And in fact, you know, though Homo sapiens have been around for about 300,000 years, this rate is going up so fast that more than 7% of every Homo sapiens who has ever walked on this planet is alive today. And actually, because most humans died as children, that means that over 20% of every adult Homo sapiens ever who ever lived is currently alive. Um, and, and that number goes up every year. I, I, you know, I could go on, right? The, the list is long here, but I want to get back to Victor Frankenstein here. All right. Victor Frankenstein, it turns out, is the monster, right? The abandonment of Victor's creation was a monstrous act. And it serves as the motivation for the nearly limitless revenge that this monster exacts on Victor and his friends and family. The monster gives him several opportunities to acknowledge him, his creation, his Adam, but still Victor flees and denies him in horror. Now, Victor behaves narcissistically over his godlike achievement, but he refuses to take responsibility for it. Now, this shock and horror at the creation is not usually shown in movie portrayals of Victor, but other monstrous characteristics of mania, narcissism, narcissism, egotism, excessive pride, and other forms of insanity are typically presented. This is that wonderful moment where he cries, it's alive. 
right? Oscars were just this weekend. We even see shades of Victor and Michael Shannon's character in this year's Oscar-winning movie, The Shape of Water. Now, Shannon's character doesn't create the creature, but he does discover him and bring him home. And his extreme cruelty and inhumanity um, leave no doubt by the end of the movie that he's the monster and, and not the godlike sea creature. Well, if this is true, then by my analogy, we are the monster, right? By how we have treated our planet um, that we now control um, in decidedly inhumane ways. Um, at the start of each year, Nicholas Kristof writes this article every year um, in the New York Times about how the previous year was the best year ever, regardless of the year. Well, best for humans. Okay. When I was born, more than half of the world's three billion people um, were illiterate. And more than half of them lived in extreme poverty. And that's not the case anymore. Now, less than 15% of the world's seven and a half billion are illiterate. And less than 10% live in extreme poverty. I mean, things clearly have gotten better for humans. And and every single day, another 300,000 people get access for the first time to electricity and to clean water. And another 200,000 rise up out of poverty. But there have been extreme consequences for our planet in the process. This is, a, um, this is the sort of thing that I wake up in the shower sometimes. Uh, I mean, I, Actually, I do wake up in the shower sometimes, but I, I um, you know, just like gasping for breath. Um, Earth's vertebrate animal populations have declined by more than half, 58% from 1970 to 2012. Um, in this 42-year period, um, and, and the, the vertebrate animals, so mammals, amphibians, reptiles, fish, and, and birds. This is an extensive World Wildlife Fund study of over 15,000 populations around the world. Um, that is a staggering number. I mean, what happens? It's less than my lifetime. What happens in the next 40 years? I mean, are they all gone? Well, we know that there are going to be plenty of cows and chickens and pigs, and there's some animals like birds and rats that seem to really do well around us. But most everything else is having a hard time. Um, what's happened? Well, we've killed them. Um, you know, most of them we've actually eaten or killed for sport. Um, but there's also habitat degradation and habitat loss and direct effects of climate change, invasive species largely at our travel, um, pollution. Um, and in fact, look, we now use about one and a half Earth's worth of bioresources. Um, the, the last time, in fact, we lived at a level where the earth actually supplied the bioresources that we needed it was back in 1970. It's the intersection of this biocapacity line with the, the total amount of um, the global land that would be needed to, to meet our needs. And we're now 50% above that, and that number goes up every year. I, I mean, how is this possible? Well, we're borrowing against our children's futures. You know, the oceans have been overstocked and the, the forests are getting cut. Um, and, oh, and by the way, since I started talking, um, more than 6,000 new mouths to feed have been added to the planet. All right, chapter 10, embracing the monster. All right, much of the book of Frankenstein consists of Victor's angst as he tries to figure out what to do. He goes back and forth between ignoring his creation altogether, trying to appease it, or naively trying to destroy it. And everything he does seems to make the situation worse. And one by one, all the people he loves are killed off by the monster in revenge. At one point, Victor even agrees to create a female companion for him, an Eve for his Adam. But, but then he changes his mind and he destroys her, and that enrages the monster even further. Victor is both fearful of the monster and shamed by the deaths that he has, as a result, caused. And, and, and this drives him to make one more bad decision after the next. Now, first his denial and then his shame also prevent him from telling his friends, family, or authorities what he's done. 
Victor never actually acknowledges his creation, so he doesn't seek help. And because he is so far overmatched by his opponent here, um, he fails miserably at each attempt. Each, you know. Now, by the end of the story, all his friends and family gone, Victor dies in the captain's ship room. The, the, the creature visits, cries over the body of his creator, and then heads out across the ice, presumably to die himself. You know, pretty much everybody's dead. Not every. In the end, a lesson is learned by the young captain, Robert Walton, uh, played here in a BBC version by Aidan Quinn that um, also starred Kenneth Branagh as, um, as Victor Frankenstein and Robert De Niro as the, the monster. Um, in spite of Victor's mad and delirious entreaty that Walton continue on to the North Pole at all costs for pride and glory, Walton does actually end up listening to the entreaties of his crew. And he turns back home, thus the survival of the story. Otherwise, we'd never have heard about it. So what is the lesson here, then, for us about our monstrous creation of global warming? Well, with some exceptions, um, which unfortunately seem to include about 40% of our voting population in the U.S., the world now seems to be very aware of at least some of the future hazards of global warming. Um, the trick is how to get us to do something about it. Now, part of the problem is that there is now just so much bad news that most of us are overwhelmed by it. We end up just tuning it out. Uh, we become numb to it, right? You, you probably did this. I probably did this too right now, just over the last 20 minutes. I probably seriously bummed you out. Well, so it's important also to emphasize examples where positive change is being made. Because, you know, if you don't, people can either end up going into such denial about the problems or feeling so much societal shame that they become paralyzed. Now, we don't want to go into denial about global warming. That's societal neurosis. You know, it's a detachment from reality. It's a form of insanity. In terms of environmental and climate issues, our current United States administration is insane. Um, it is entirely detached from reality. Now, it wasn't always this way. You know, in, eight, in 1969, NEPA, the, the National Environmental Policy Act, which cre created the Environmental Protection Agency, passed unanimously in the U.S. Senate. You know, Richard Nixon was the environmental president. It was totally bipartisan. So did the 1970 Clean Air Act extension the following year. Even in 1988, George Herbert Bush ran on environmental issues and sweeping extensions to the Clean Air Act um, passed the Senate 89 to 11. This, this was never uh, a partisan issue. Um, the current administration, however, claims that climate change is a hoax um, and that we need to end regulations protecting the air we breathe and the water we drink. Now, I don't know to what degree um, this is inadvertent insanity or calculated insanity, but this is a very misguided and dangerous way of thinking. At the other extreme, you don't want people to feel shame over for the environmental errors we've made. You know, and I, I feel very strongly here that you know it's important for us to realize that there is really no realistic way that we could have gotten to this point in history um, without causing inadvertent impacts to our planet, right? We learn by making mistakes, um, and that goes for countries as well as people. The mistakes, they're not only inevitable but necessary. But if you make a mistake, you try again. You know, I, I, I like the, um, the, defin the original definition of the word to sin. It's an old English archery term. It means to miss the mark, right? If you sin, you miss the mark. You try again. Um, it's how we learn, and this should apply to our impacts on our environment and climate as well. All right, so what are some of the examples where we have learned from our mistakes and taken positive actions? There are actually quite a few of them. For instance, the ozone hole, right? NASA atmospheric scientists showed us that we didn't ban chlorofluorocarbons. The entire ozone layer was going to be gone by 2060. Well, we did. We took action, and the ozone hole has begun to heal. Um, it's going in the right direction. The world recognized a problem, worked together, and, and took action. Um, renewable energy, right? Um, the, the amount of um, 
carbon-free or relatively free power from wind and solar has been going up rapidly. And this is directly connected to the drop in cost as technology has improved. And this has led to a tremendous increase in, in these uh, installations. And, you know, coal companies are going bankrupt. Solar wind and power is rapidly increasing. The, the market has spoken on, on, on this issue. And another good example is air pollution in our country, right? This chart shows several things and how factors, how they've changed since the Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. And, you know, our gross domestic product more than doubled and we drive more and our population is going up and we use more energy. But still, our air pollution, judged in this case by the six major criteria pollutants, has gone significantly down, right? We took action and things got better. So, how do we take responsibility for global warming? And this is my final chapter here, embracing the monster. I think we start by teaching our children. Um, first of all, children are open to new ideas, new challenges, and they're going to inherit the earth. Um, they have a very vested interest in this. And, and children grow up. You know, I, I think of all those 17-year-olds down in Parkland, Florida, the ones who are organizing rallies and, and facing down politicians. By November, election time, they're going to be 18. Now, I will tell you what gives me hope and what lets me go back to sleep sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night, you know, trembling that more of the half, the, well, you know, more than half the world's vertebrate animals have died. Um, it is a new and innovative way of teaching science in schools that is now um, moving into most schools in our country. It's called the Next Generation Science Standards. And um, if you are not familiar with this, the kindergarten through 12, the K-12 Next Generation Science Standards are centered around having students do the practices of science and engineering instead of memorizing facts about science. This started at the National Academy of Science. It was finished by a group of scientists and educators from 26 participating states, um, half red, half blue, entirely bipartisan. It builds upon the latest research, not only in science, but also in pedagogy and child psychology and child development. And it is much more effective in not only increasing student understanding of science, but also increasing student enthusiasm and appreciation and engagement with science. It basically, from their perspective, it's fun. And um, I have to say, in a recent international uh, survey of, of science education, one of the few things that American students lead the world in is currently is boredom. Uh, and that's nothing to be proud of. Now, the next generation science standards are built around these three dimensions, uh, practices, core ideas, and cross-cutting concepts. And the basic idea is the practices play the central role of science and engineering, and they are organized around important key I core ideas of science, but they are learned through storylines of understanding that build and apply those ideas over time, okay? Now, one thing I'm happiest about this is that the oversimplified and misnamed scientific method has finally been replaced, you know, and removed, um, replaced with a diversity of science and engineering practices that more accurately encompasses the range of practices that science and scientists and engineers actually do. And, and I have to say, one of the things that's most important about this is that um, this is now science and engineering. I mean, traditionally, engineering was largely marginalized in K-12 science education. I remember a textbook I had, you know, on space science, and at the end of the chapter, there was some little box of how, how NASA had discovered Tang, or, or you know, and, and, you know, and, and that's, um, that's not right. Uh, and... Um, students aren't going to have like a three-week module on developing and using models and then go back to memorizing the names of clouds or something. All the science content that they will learn will be through doing these practices, um, all of them each year. Now, the third dimension, 
are these very broad, transdisciplinary, cross-cutting concepts, things like patterns and systems and energy and matter and stability and change that run throughout their whole K-12 program and allow them to develop a stronger intuitive sense of how science works across um, all of the, the different disciplines. And perhaps most importantly, the NGSS promotes phenomenon-based learning. The, 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 the idea of having big picture phenomena, these sort of essential questions that provide these storylines around which the content and practices and the cross-cutting concepts are all learned. You know, these challenges are approached from a holistic perspective, viewed from a variety of viewpoints that bring in also, you know, the tools and skills that the students bring to the class. Now, as of now, 18 states and Washington, D.C. have adopted the NGSS verbatim. Um, another two, Minnesota and Maine, are considering it. Another dozen plus have adapted it, sometimes um, by changing a few words, sometimes changing it a little bit more. Um, and a bunch of other states are in process of doing that. Currently, about 80% of all U.S. school children are in schools that are in the process of transferring over to this. And textbook companies and curriculum developers and everybody are all on board, totally redoing their science programs to, to meet this. Now, one thing also that is, I think, really important for my talk today, um, and that is middle school and high school will involve a year of life science, a year of physical science, that's chemistry and physics, and a year of earth and space science. Yes, that's right. High school students in all of these schools will be getting a year of quantitative, high-level, interdisciplinary earth and space science with topics like climate and climate change. You know? Now, I'll just, can I have a couple more minutes? How am I doing? Okay, I'm just going to wrap up here with a couple, few last points. It's critical for our children to be able to mean a sense of hope as they inherit our planet, right? And the NGSS, I think, fosters this hope in a couple of ways. It focuses on designing solutions to problems and not the problems themselves. We talk about human impacts, pollution, global warming, impacts on the biosphere. It's all in there, K through 12. Um, but the focus is on finding the solutions, designing, engineering solutions to those problems. Yeah? It isn't presented them <laughs> to them the way I presented it to you as a list of society's failings. You know? We wrote this as a set of challenges that students will analyze, size up, assess, and then design and engineer solutions to. Now, the NGSS also has a strong emphasis on societally relevant topics, such as information technologies, genetics, human impacts, that let students know how powerful they are, you know, all that anthropozoic stuff. Um, but in a way that emphasizes responsibility through designing solutions that balance costs, and by costs we mean societal and environmental, as well as financial, with the human benefit. And the last point I want to make is that the NGSS um, are not optional. You don't choose some topics and leave out others. These are all standards for all students. These aren't AP classes. This is what the minimum what all students will do. And you also don't choose some students and leave out others. Um, you know, science has traditionally been the privilege of white men um, for centuries like Victor Frankenstein, like me. Um, white men currently have 55% of all STEM jobs in this country, and white women have 18%, right? In contrast, um, Hispanic and Latin men and women have 4% of STEM jobs, and men and women of color have 3%, right? This does not reflect the demographics of our country. And in that sense, STEM education is very much a social justice issue. And, and this is a very important issue for the NGSS. You know, and many of these student performances will be quantitative and computational and focused on finding and designing solutions to challenges. And I'm just going to read you a couple. 
This is an example of what the performance expectations actually look like. Um, this is high school, earth and space science. Uh, they always begin with students who demonstrate understanding can, colon, followed by a verb. In this case, develop a quantitative model to describe the cycling of carbon among the hydrosphere, atmosphere, geosphere, and biosphere. They're not memorizing anything here. They are developing a quantitative model. And that's how you assess that. Um, students who demonstrate understanding can use a model to describe how variations in the flow of energy in and out of Earth systems result in changes in climate. Students who demonstrate understanding can create a computational simulation to illustrate the relationships among management of natural resources, the sustainability of human populations, and biodiversity. Students who demonstrate understanding can analyze geoscience data and the results from global climate models to make an evidence-based forecast of the current rate of global or regional climate change and associated future impacts to Earth systems. This is high school. And students who demonstrate understanding can evaluate or refine a technological solution that reduces impacts of human activities on natural systems. I mean, these are the kinds of experiences and practices that students coming to Washington University in the near future will have. You know, and I will, I will add, I have to say that after years of enviously eyeing the K-12 science educational systems of other countries, it is now really encouraging for me that many other countries are now looking at the NGSS as a model of their own K-12 science education programs. All right. Frankenstein's a tragedy, right? Victor was no match for the monster he created. It was bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, always a step ahead. And once Victor created the monster, there were no easy solutions for him, right? There wasn't some easy fix to this that he missed. But whatever that solution would have been for Victor, um, coming to terms with the creature or reaching out to others for help in dealing with it, Victor couldn't do it because he never took responsibility for it. Now, Mary Shelley's lesson for us, however, is that we don't have to make those same mistakes. Like Captain Walton, we can turn back. You know, the story of Frankenstein serves as a warning for young victors and victorias everywhere, right? Modern biomedicine and bioengineering now actually does give 22-year-olds the power to play with the rules of life itself, to dare to be godlike. But the lesson of Frankenstein serves as a reminder to them of the responsibility that has to come with that power. Okay? And we are now all playing God with our planet. And we're kind of making a mess of it. Um, but we have a choice. It's not too late. We can learn the lesson Mary Shelley put forth for us. We don't have to deny our creation of global warming. We don't have to run from it. We don't have to feel shame for it. We can learn from Victor's mistakes and take responsibility for it and work to fix it. You know, today's children um, are going to face some serious challenges as they grow up. Um, but I'm hopeful that with uh, a K-12 education that finally actually fully embraces environmental earth issues across all grades for all children, including climate and climate change, and our role in it, and allows them to learn it in a fun and engaging manner, um, that they will make the right choices. Okay, I'll stop. And I will sit glasses so I can answer any questions and see. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions. I want. Well, no, just if, if you would repeat the question because we didn't have that. Oh. Um, yeah, of course, the proof is in the pudding. The question was, how do you get more equitable funding? And you're striking at a very hard question that is deeply rooted in our...
country. We're not so much a nation as a loose collective of, of states. And even within states, we see that in St. Louis County, it's not really a county, it's a loose collective of townships. And nobody wants to pay too much attention to what's on the other street over. It, that's, I don't have an answer to that. I'm sorry. Um, well, it's interesting. We thought there would be a lot of pushback with evolution, and we worked, um, I, I don't know if you know, um, Eugenie, Eugenie Scott was here for Darwin Day a couple weeks ago. Um, she was head of the National Center for Science Education. We worked very closely with her on making sure the wording um, did not allow any trap doors for intelligent design or creationism. Um, but um, we were prepared for large fights, and it didn't really come. Um, the lines have kind of been, they've, they've gotten defeated in court so many times um, that they've kind of stepped back. I'm sure they're just regrouping. Um, where we did get the huge pushback was climate change. Um, and actually, this is a whole other story, but um, for instance, West Virginia, when I showed that list of states, um, changed one word. There's a middle school um, uh, performance expectation, ESS 3.5, where it actually specifies the role of humans in the rise of global temperatures. They change the rise of global temperatures to the change of global temperatures. One word. Um, but all the other states who were NGSS states, they said, yeah, you, you can't be part of the club. You've significantly changed the meaning. So they're in a, an adapting state and not an adopting state. Um, in Oklahoma, the Natural Gas Pipeline Licensing Board got to edit the climate change standards. And guess what? In Oklahoma, there's no climate change. So um, when the rest of the world has a problem, we can all go to Oklahoma because there's no, not any climate change there. Um, so, so that's an issue. Wyoming was a big issue. They were going to, they were gung ho about the NGSS, and they saw all this stuff in there about carbon and climate change. And you know, 35 miles of coal trains leave Wyoming every day. Um, and so, but so, so the legislature shut it down. There's such a demand from their teachers, though, um, that they are now in the process of adopting the NGSS in some form. But Missouri changed very little. Um, but it, um, and they didn't change the intent of, of any of these, but it, it had to be Missouri's. Missouri was initially going to have absolutely nothing to do with NGSS, but you notice all the states around its borders adopted it, and the teachers started using it, because it makes sense to teach this way. So they realized, okay, we have to do this. Um, but it's, um, and they had a survey, uh, you know, that you could go, and for each of the different performance expectations, you could say if you liked it or didn't, make comments. So, so there were changes. The wording has changed. But it, it doesn't change the, the, uh, the emphasis and the intent of it. So there was a, um, let's see, question here, here, and then here. Um, next generation science standards. It's not national. And, and this is actually very important for political reasons, you know, um, the Common Core ran into a lot of problems because of these race to the top funds that the president had put forward. Well, the next generation science standards were entirely done by states, four states. Not a penny of federal funding went towards it, so there's no conflict. And the reason is it's illegal in, the, in this country. It's against the law to have a national science curriculum, right? No state wants to be told, um, you know, what guns they can carry, who they, you know, what they can smoke, and sure as heck how to teach their kids. So this is not a national program. This is a states-led program. <coughs> so if you had a magic wand and you were able to have it that NGSS was adopted by every state in time for students this fall, naturally there's going to be a lag between the time that that cohort of students goes through an entirely uh, revamped science curriculum. So are you hopeful for the time period between today and when those students become policymakers and have you know, seats at the, at the table and legislators that we're not going to be doing too much damage to turn the, to turn the ship? Um, OK. I'm a geologist. I, I take a long perspective on these things, right? Uh, you know, it was back in 1893 that 
Charles Elliott, the president of Harvard, and nine other university professors, the Committee of Ten, set us on a course, for instance, of having high school consist of biochem and physics. And we've been stuck in that for 125 years. Um, this is going to take a while to do. And Stephen Pruitt, who is the head of the writing team, whenever he gave a presentation, he, he, he ended every presentation with a picture of the front page of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. There's a big red button with the words, don't panic. Okay? Um, this is going to take a long time. Um, if, you know... If this phases in over 10 years, I will be elated. Um, of course, we don't have a magic wand, and, and different states interpret it differently in different, different timelines. But the, the, really, the key is, this is the largest shift in science education clearly in my lifetime. And it is a significant shift to an entirely different way because it goes after the assessments, and that's really the key. Because the old assessments, if you were te testing what people knew, then that's very simple because you say, well, okay, you know, like uh, you're talking about the solar system. Well, how many planets are there? You know, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever it's nine. Oops, Neil deGrasse and the removal of Pluto. We have the world's expert on Pluto in the back here, Bill McKinnon. Um, it's eight planets. Oh, wait a minute. We have a perturbation to Neptune's orbit. Maybe there is a ninth planet. What does it matter? Nobody cares. Everybody has one of these. We can look it up. The point is, it's a solar system. It behaves as a system. There's a flow of energy and a cycling of matter, and this affects us. The gravitational pulls of the other planets change our orbit and cause our ice ages and do all these important, cool things. Um, that's, you know, and, and um, assessing students on what they can do instead of what they memorize will drive the whole system in a different direction, and that's the thing that I'm really most excited about. You propose, well, the NGSS proposes that we have our physical science, our life science, and our earth space science. And while that all sounds beautiful, I wonder how you think this is going to be stacked. Right now in the state of Missouri, for physical science position, there are rural districts that have no applicants. Right down the street, they have one applicant. How are we going to staff earth science for the whole state? Can't do it. You can't, it's not by the current right. system. Yeah. Well, that, uh, my point is it is a process. So, I mean, you have to then go. Now, some states have, have, are really prepared for this. So, for instance, Washington State, they have all 11 of the major organizations that do pre-service teacher training working together. All of the teachers now coming out are fully trained in NGSS, and they were prepared for this in 2013 when the NGSS was finally released. Other states haven't done a darn thing about it. Um, but... States are now looking at Washington saying, oh, that's a really good idea. That works. And they're starting to change their systems. Um, another important thing for the NGSS is because this is not a national program, because it's against the law to have a national curriculum, the NGSS can't tell any state how to teach it. So some districts are breaking up the earth and space science and putting it into existing biochem and physics classes. Um, some districts in California are creating a separate semester-long high school course in just an earth and space science and then taking the geochemistry and geophysics and the geobiology parts and putting those into the chem, physics, and bio classes. There are lots of creative ideas across the country now on how to actually um, develop curricula and programs, but it's going to take a while. And so, yes, right now, in many cases, there are not the teachers to do that. But if there is a need for it, um, that, you know, over time it will be filled. But, yeah, it's, it's, you know, any time you make a, a huge change that significantly affects human resources, where people have trained for decades to, to do something, um, you, you can't do it instantly. It's not possible. possible. So, yeah, that is a problem. All right.